Thank you, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Institute for having me here. Uh, my sponsor, Jeff Lescovar, for helping put this on, this important um, conference. And it's been wonderful to be here and see the new documentary and, and everything and getting a chance to talk to so many people. And uh, to present on this topic, Prohibition as the Sword of the State. Um, I wrote my dissertation with the help of the Mises Institute in graduate school. I published a book on the topic of the economics of prohibition, and I've been writing and talking about prohibition and the economics of prohibition now for 40 years. Um, and I've never talked about this particular topic. Prohibition is typically on the periphery. When it comes to microeconomics, mainstream economists dismiss it as something about addiction and something that they don't understand, so they leave it out of their models. When it comes to macroeconomics, they say it's too small and hard to measure, so they can't measure the uh, impact of the black market, and so they ignore it. And then when it comes to money, all of a sudden it's not too small, it's too big. The black market cash is, is too big, uh, and that's why we have to have the war on cash. Um, and the only reason they can come up with here is they just don't like it. So they don't understand it, they can't measure it, and they just don't like it. Um, but the topic nonetheless is very important to the people I've talked to here personally uh, in all the tragedies that are involved in it. I've talked to the staff of the resort here and they all have um, very tragic stories of friends and family involved in it. And, and so, you know, it's, it is important, but my topic here today, prohibition as the sword of the state, actually brings prohibition from the periphery to center stage. Prohibition and the state, it's important to realize that prohibition is the one thing in the United States where the government or the state can bring the fist of violence into our daily lives. Fortunately, in the United States, the military is prevented mostly from intervening in our lives domestically. And so the prohibitionist and the progressives in particular have had to concoct something in order to have the physical power of violence in order to our, invade our lives in order to intimidate us and to make us feel like we are good, protected sheep. Progressives used prohibition to punish their enemies. They used prohibition to penalize their opponents. Pro, uh, pro, uh, excuse me, progressives use prohibition in order to gain power for themselves, the state. And it's really, like in all cases, uh, with power, the potential to use power is more important than actually using power. You have to demonstrate your ability to use a gun, uh, to kill people, to put people in prison, but the potential to do that is what matters most, the threat of violence. So, you know, if you don't pay your taxes, there's always the threat of the IRS and going to jail. So they use prohibition to demonstrate their ability to use violence as the state, or conversely, they use the existence of the violence of prohibition as some way of protecting the weak sheep in the population. Symbolically, the sword is the symbol of absolute royal authority of the state. The policy of prohibition in the United States is a real world presence 
of the progressive socialist power in which the state brandishes its power and authority over the people. Conveniently for the cause of the state, it divides us as a population into outcasts and protected sheep. It also has the great idea for building and maintaining state power within it. As demonstrated by Mises' theory of progressive interventionism, prohibition never solves any problem but it creates a host of new problems while exacerbating the existing ones. Prohibition is a magnificent example of Mises' theory and understanding, just as Alex Pollack explained how you go from 1694 and now you have this all-powerful uh, Federal Reserve, which is in effect a fourth branch of government. Progressive socialists came to power in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century. Their influence quickly materialized at the state and local levels of government, where they went to work doing a lot of busybody things, but in particular, implementing a horde of government interventions directed at alcohol and drugs, such as opium. The progressives' crowning achievements were the infamous constitutional amendments, which included the 18th Amendment, which prohibited alcohol across the country. Amendments 10 through 15 signify the breakdown of the American Republic. Amendment 16, which was the income tax, 17, direct election of senators, 18, Alcohol prohibition, yes, you get to pick your favorite one. Um, and 19, women's suffrage. Is there any boors here? Um, those amendments represent the rise of the progressive socialist regime and also the, at least the beginnings of Karl Marx's vision of the 10-point program of the Communist Manifesto here in America. The next several amendments signaling the imperial presidency. Now, below the constitutional level, Congress had passed the Harrison Narcotics Act in 1914, which quickly devolved into, uh, from a tax and regulation piece of legislation to an across-the-board prohibition. The Volstead Act was passed in 1919, providing the actual sort of enforcement for alcohol prohibition, and the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937, a couple of years after alcohol prohibition was repealed, was nearly instantaneously um, turned by the bureaucracy from a tax piece of legislation and regulation into an outright prohibition, which targeted minorities, which is always a key feature of the racist progressive agenda, and in this case, primarily targeted Germans, Irish Americans, Italians, blacks, and Chinese. This heyday of the progressive movement was also the pinnacle of anti-homosexual legislation. The 21st Amendment could be seen as a setback for the progressive socialist power on the one hand, however, it was also a necessary tactical move on the other. And it had a highly favorable result for the long-term progressive cause. Alcohol prohibition was a miscalculation and overreach of the progressive mindset. And generally, as generally described by Rothbard, the progressive leader is of high intellect and foremost ego, but it is also one lacking in basic common sense of the real world. Once in power, it is an emotional child in a giant's body, seeking to gain and employ power to its fullest, with abandon and with a religious fervor. 
most were, were, mo were non-believers, and their mission can be seen as purifying the earth for the second coming of their parents' God and for the, the becoming of their own godlike supremacy. Alcohol prohibition brought the required toxic brew into American society. Rampant criminal activity, violence, political corruption, and organized crime. Everywhere one looked in society of pre-World War I America had lost its peace and justice. Newspapers jumped on the bandwagon of the time and naturally tilted away from reporting on society to report on the grungy details fueling social anxiety. Gunshots and sirens disturbed sleep nightly in urban areas. Alcohol in, alcoholism and drunkenness ran rampant. Women, for the first time, frequented speakeasies and wore short skirts. Wall Street engaged in leverage and investing like never before. The fact that the machine gun was outlawed tells you all you need to know about how society was changed by the progressives. The American Republic had been the most peaceful and prosperous society the world had ever known before they showed up on the scene. The progressives with their wars, socialism, interventionism, adoption of Karl Marx's 10-point program of the Communist Manifesto produced a cancerous chaos, turning America into a violent monster. Lisa McGreer described the war on alcohol in similar terms to a slave plantation. Quote, the enforcement of prohibition was notable for its magnitude and its selectivity, not surprisingly for a movement that uh, led at its core by the well-heeled Protestant Anti-Saloon League Enforcement hit working class, urban immigrant, and poor communities hardest. It was, after all, enacted to discipline their leisure in the first place. And of course, we can see a almost uh, completely parallel situation today uh, with the war on drugs and the negative impact on minority groups. The overriding purpose of the prohibitionist and the progressives the same group, was not to control alcohol consumption so much as it was meant to control the non-elite population of Catholics and immigrants and minorities that they wished to control. Most progressives seem too naive to actually plot such a successful route to their ultimate goal of a full-fledged police force state. But if you ultimately are successful in the long run, it does appear that that was the plan all along. Using alcohol prohibition to create chaos and then to intervene with police state power. Alcohol prohibition had unleashed crime and chaos that permitted the progressives to start building a strong police state. Hiding behind the reputation of an individualist, so-called, Herbert Hoover bolstered the federal penal state and, quote, the use of an expanded state power. Now, I've been asked for many, many years, are these progressive types, are they stupid? <laughs> or, or are they just evil? And my answer has always been both. I mean, <laughs> nobody, nobody is a one-dimensional person. And, the, and then the only, set, the only real sense that progressives are people too, they have more than one dimension. They can be stupid. They can be evil. They certainly all are arrogant. And most of them are very naive. Um, Irving Fisher, the progressive economist who really worked harder than anybody to get alcohol prohibition in place, um, also got all of his economic predictions wrong. He 
was quoted in the New York Times week after week as the stock market was crashing in 29 and in 30, you know, we've, we reached a high plateau we're, and we're going to stay there. And then as the market crashed, he said, oh, this is just a temporary lull. And it just kept on going down and he kept on preaching perpetual prosperity. He got it all wrong. His whole method of economic thinking, certainly his thinking on prohibition was all wrong. Now, a little bit closer to a real conspiracy was John D. Rockefeller. He personally financed the anti-alcohol movement. We know of at least $2.7 million that he donated to the prohibition of alcohol uh, movement. And of course, initially when I was studying this in my dissertation stage, I thought, well, you know, he was a Baptist. And he was a progressive that wanted, you know, people to improve and be pure and all that, just like a lot of other people did. Um, so you kind of understood, but it was only later that I realized that the early automobiles, um, most of the early automobile models were fueled not by his gasoline, but by alcohol. And so these, his successful anti-alcohol movement took off all the models that were alcohol-based engines and made all of the early automobile, and for decades to come, gasoline or diesel-based engines uh, that was a tremendous benefit for himself. Um, the 21st Amendment, which repealed alcohol, was a great victory for society, but it was a calculated move by the progressives. Their policy had been a disaster and was teetering, um, in particular with progressive President Herbert Hoover's prohibitionist interventionist administration crashing uh, the stock market and the economy and bringing us the Great Depression. Ironically, it was progressive Franklin Delano Roosevelt who was also a dry candidate. So he supported uh, prohibition, and it was the one thing holding him back to become the Democratic Party's nominee for president in 1932. There was a rising tide of the people against alcohol prohibition, against uh, the 18th Amendment, and FDR simply switched his views on a dime from being a dry candidate in support of prohibition to being the wet candidate in favor of its repeal. So he switched the constant, the 21st Amendment uh, swept the nation um, and alcohol was repealed as FDR was coming into office. Um, and so I've argued that the real reason for, and this makes sense, I think, in our perspective, the real reason for FDR's popularity in the 1930s was not that he defeated the Great Depression. It was not because of the New Deal, which had many, many opponents throughout the country. And it certainly wasn't that he won World War II, which didn't occur till much later. The real reason that he was popular in the 1930s was because he symbolically was associated with the repeal of alcohol prohibition, which reduced the price of a drink by 80% and created millions of, not new jobs, but previously existing jobs. It made it easier to finance local schools and so on. It stopped a lot of the gunfire, it stopped a lot of the um, the raids and so forth. Um, and so I argue, and there's a paper on Mises.org, where I argue that it was the repeal of prohibition that is the real reason for FDR's popularity, and that the only reason that it is now associated with the New Deal and World War II and the progressive part of his agenda is because of the media, intelligentsia, which has imprinted all of that on the social mindset. The actual responsibility for his popularity 
at the time was because he repealed prohibition. He went along with the people as a popular issue rather than and turned against his own progressivism. Hopefully, we can get more politicians to do the same. Thank you.